right, go ahead and take your Bibles tonight. We're going to start out, we're going to have you turn to two different places. Go to Jeremiah chapter 23 and Ezekiel chapter 34. We're going to look at two Old Testament passages. We're going to look at something God said in there. And I, I mostly want to preach from them, but I'm going to show you, even though this is Old Testament stuff here, uh, we're going to see that the same thing is said in the New Testament. And there's some great lessons that we can learn from this. And I want us to look at... Uh, uh, some characters in the Bible in the Old Testament, some bad characters, people that I don't like. Don't we all have our favorite Bible characters? You know, everybody's got their favorite Bible character that they have. And then there's just some people in the Bible I don't like. And we're going to look at some of those people that I really do not like uh, as we get towards the end of this. And uh, one of the reasons I want to preach this message, I am preaching this message to you so you know what the Bible says about it in case you ever need to preach it to me. All right? I, I need you all you know, to help hold me accountable and keep me in line. I don't, want to, I don't ever want to go off the deep end and uh, you know, lead folks astray. And so there's some great lessons about a pastor that we're going to see from these passages. And, and you all need to know them in case that I ever need to be reminded of them. So keep that in mind as we... Go through this, but Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Okay, now I understand this, po this passage here, you know, does have some Old Testament significance, all right? I understand it's talking about specific things, it's talking about, you know, Israel, but at the same time, we're going to see later that in the New Testament, basically the same thing is said to pastors in the New Testament that we see right here. And we see he's talking to pastors and he said, like, well, they didn't, you know, this wasn't a New Testament church. They didn't have pastors in like we do today. I understand all that, but you understand too that, you know, the term pastor and shepherd are basically the same thing. You know, he's talking to leaders here. Okay. People who are, who are leading people who are influencing people, you know, what, whether it was priests that was probably, you know, it was probably who he was talking about during that time or whatever, if you're, if you're leading people, if you're leading them spiritually and you're leading them astray and you start to scatter the flock, woe unto you. That's a, that's a terrible thing. And then turn over to Ezekiel chapter 34. Keep your fingers there in Jeremiah, but turn over to Ezekiel chapter 34. And we're going to see uh, some similar things said in this passage. And it says, and the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Okay. Same thing. Shepherds and pastors. It's the same thing. Prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. 
For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them unto their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel uh, shall their fold be. There they shall lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down saith the Lord God. So right here we see Jeremiah and Ezekiel both calling out the shepherds of Israel, calling out the pastors for not doing their job. He's saying, he's saying you're shepherds, but they have no shepherd. Okay, these people, they had the titles, but they weren't doing their job. Therefore, the people didn't have a shepherd. And you know, there's a lot of churches out there today. They have pastors. There's a guy that has the title of pastor, but he's not doing the job of the pastor. Therefore, according to the Bible, they have no pastor. And we see here, it mentions the duties of the pastor. And I, so this is all Old Testament here, but I just, I don't want you to get ahead of me. I'm going to show you, it says the same thing in the New Testament, but one of the jobs of the shepherd or a pastor is to feed the flock. Jeremiah 23, 2, he said, you know, he mentioned, he said, you've scattered my flock, you've driven away and have not visited, you've not visited them. Behold, I will visit you, saith the Lord, because of the evil your doings. He mentioned, you know, he talked about them scattering. You haven't fed them. Uh, it was mentioned there in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And a pastor is supposed to feed the flock before feeding themselves. Look what it says in verse 2 of Ezekiel chapter 34. It says, uh, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds eat the flocks? Ye eat the fat. And ye clothe you with the wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. And I'm going to show you some guys in the Old Testament that did that very thing. God was disgusted by this. I mean, they were, they're supposed to be feeding the flock, but they're just feeding themselves. They're getting everything they can from it. And you know what? There's a lot of pastors out there today that, I mean, they're feeding, they're getting fed pretty good. I mean, sometimes you can see how good they're getting fed. You know what I mean? They're, I mean, they have... Uh, built a name for themselves. They've got this, you know, big place. They're a big shot, but their people are starving spiritually. They're not preaching anything from the word They're, I mean, they're denying people a lot of the truths that God has commanded us to preach them. They can't get up like the apostle Paul and say, you know, I mean, I've preached everything to you, everything I'm supposed to. I don't remember how he said it exactly, but you know, I, I declared everything to you. He didn't hold back anything that was profitable. I mean, you got these preachers today. All they want to do is just preach about the love of God every week and preaching about the love of God's great, but there's a lot of other stuff you got to preach about too. I mean, they're, they're so scared of running off, you know, brother money bags in the church because if they lose him, well, then the pastor might have to get a pay cut and the pastor is more interested in feeding himself than he is feeding the flock. And listen, if it's in the word of God, the people need that. They need to hear it. They need to hear the truth. And you got preachers, they're so worried about themselves that they are denying the flock, the church, what God wants for them to ha wants them to have so they can just stuff their faces, so they can be their big shots, so they can drive their fancy cars and live in their nice houses. God's disgusted with that kind of thing. We see also a pastor is supposed to visit the flock. He mentioned in verse 2, God said, you've not visited them. I'm going to visit upon you the evil of your doings. Okay. And the, that term visit, when you see that in that passage, in that context, sometimes when it talks about visiting, it doesn't always mean just, Hey, going over to their house and saying, hello, how's everything going? All right. That, that, that's not always talking about that, but sometimes visiting is a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. You know, a pastor, they should try to visit people when they're going, if they're going through a hard time, if they have a need, you know, if, if they're, maybe they're needing counsel in an area. Ezekiel 34, verse 4, it says, The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which is broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. Sometimes you need to go visit people and t tell them, Hey, what's wrong? 
you know, you're not being a very good Christian. You know, sometimes you got to visit them, you know, to get on them. You know, and we see too, he said, because you didn't visit them, I'm going to visit you. And he's not talking about a friendly visit. He's not talking about coming over for dinner for some good fellowship. No, he's going to visit them. He's going to visit them with judgment. Okay. And obviously as a pastor, I, I don't have the authority to come over to your house and, you know, collect back tithe and, you know, you know, administer punishments, uh, you know, right there at your house. But, you know, sometimes I, out of love, I might need to say, Hey, what's going on? You know, sometimes people need to be called out. Okay. And listen, don't get offended if I ever do that. All right. Y'all aren't perfect, you know, and it's my job. Okay. If I, if I have to do that, it's just because I have to do that. All right, I'm just trying to be obedient to the Bible. Don't get all bent out of shape if I ever have to come to you and say, hey, y'all probably should work on this. You know, there's been people before that I, you know, I've had to tell them, hey, you know, you're not going to be able to work in this area if you don't fix this. And they usually get mad. We had, some, we had somebody a long time ago. They were helping in one area. They, they miss church all the time. And I told them, I said, you know, you got to be here for church if you're going to do that. And oh, you know, we understand. And they, they got mad. And the thing is, they had told me in their old church, the same thing happened in their old church. They got mad at the pastor because they were working with the kids and they were missing church all the time. And the pastor told them, Hey, you have to be at church. And they got mad and left the church. And then later they realized that was wrong. They got right. And they came back to church. Then they came here. Want to work with the kids? I said, you got to be at church. They got mad, they left, and haven't got back right they haven't got right and come back here yet. But it's like, why would you do the same thing twice? They told me two different times about them doing that and how wrong it was, and they did the same thing again. You know, it's but you know, it's no fun making those visits. I got no pleasure in that, but it has to be done. And sometimes too, you know, sometimes you need to visit people, you know, because they're sick. People are in the hospital. You know, they're, they're, sometimes people just need some encouragement. Sometimes people, they just need somebody to go pray with them. They need to know that somebody's thinking about them. Somebody cares. I, that, is, that is a job of the pastor to visit. And I, I am amazed in this area how many pastors do not visit people at all. When I, I'm telling you, when we started the church here, I was, I was constantly getting compliments from people because I visited them and they'd been in churches before, but they never had a pastor come by their house before. You know, they never had a pastor come and visit them in the hospital before. And I'm like, I thought that's what all pastors did. You know, I, I thought that, but a lot don't, they're not, they're not interested. They're not going to do that. And I'm telling you, that is wrong. I don't, and you know, you got all these churches out here that are just dying. They can't get anybody in there to save their life. And it's like, well, you pastors aren't pastoring. You're not doing anything. You know, you're not, you're not feeding the flock. You know, you get up and you read off some sermon that you got online. You didn't put any study in it. You know, you give them a bunch of vague nothingness and you expect people to, improve themselves spiritually from that you know you don't reprove you don't you know rebuke you don't even exhort and you know if you're not saying anything in your message how can you be exhorting them to do anything you got to get specific sometimes you got to say things that maybe will make people a little bit uncomfortable you, you have to do that you know they're not well they're not going to go visit somebody at their house they're not going to go visit people when they're in the hospital they're not going to go pray with them they're not doing their job and they wonder why their flocks are scattering all over the place they wonder why they can't keep them in it's because those people have no shepherd just because you have a title does not mean you are that thing and or those people have a pastor and so we see also a pastor is supposed to protect the flock from wolves. Look what it says in verse five. It says, and they were scattered because there is no shepherd and they became meat to all the beasts of the field. When they were scattered, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. They became a prey to the beast because they were just wandering. And you know what? One of the things pastors are supposed to do, they're supposed to, you know, Warn you about wolves, You're supposed to mark them that cause division. You know, we're going to warn you about some of the false teachers out there, about some of the false doctrines. You know, we're going to, don't get mad if one of these days I get up and I get on one of your favorite TV preachers. All right. These guys are leading people astray. They're fleecing people. They're getting them to send their money in. 
And if you're sending your money to these TV preachers, I don't care how big they smile and I don't care how entertaining their shows and productions are they put on, you're wasting your money. You're throwing your money away. And these people, they're phonies, they're false prophets, they're wicked. And don't get mad when I call them out. And it's, it's part of my job. You're not, most of the pastors around here, you're not going to hear them calling out these guys. You're not going to hear them say anything against Joel Osteen and Rick Warren and Joyce Meyer and who else is there? I want to name them all. I'm going to, I'm going to cover my bases. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, they're, they're not going to name those, name those people. But you know what? Those people are wolves. They're false prophets. And they're, they're crooks. Some of these people should be behind bars. That church I was talking about this morning in Sunday school with the water slide. Elevate Church. I forgot that guy's name. Bad stuff. Don't send those people money. Don't, li- don't listen to those people. These people are wicked. I mean, they're making a mockery out of Christianity. And we're, we're going we're gonna to call that stuff out. It's amazing. You know, and I- I'm always way behind on these things. You know, I- I- I'm not the best at calling out the wolves because I don't pay close enough attention to what's going on out there. Usually by the time, you know... I notice things that's after everybody's doing it. And I don't know where these things start, you know, and just some of the goofy things that are going on in church that people are doing. I'm just like, where did that come from? Who started this? And it's like, why didn't, you know, why didn't somebody say something when it first started happening? I'm telling you right now, there's a message brewing. It's brewing in my heart. I haven't started working on it yet. It's coming. I've preached on this stuff before, but I am telling you this junk that's going on in church this just community involvement stuff you know soft preaching be a part of the community thing that's going on in church i'm telling you it is it's getting out of hand in churches it's getting ridiculous it's taken over in a lot of fundamental baptist churches and i still can't figure out where the origins of this stuff are you know i don't pay attention to other religions but uh it's it's already completely infiltrated other religions but it's getting into the baptist churches and i'm telling you I don't like it one bit. I'm disgusted by it. And a message is, a message is brewing, and I can't wait to preach it. Right? You know, the Lord hasn't given me the green light on it yet. I'll preach it right now. You know, I, so I, it, it's coming. I, it, it's coming. And boy, this message that I'm going to preach it, none of those people are going to listen to it. It's really going to fix them, that's for sure. But, but it'll make me feel better. It, it's, it's going to make, it'll make me feel great. But we do, we, we gotta, we gotta protect people from that. We gotta, we gotta call it out. You know, preachers today, they get all, you know, you're, we're all so politically correct. We're not allowed to call out wolves. We're not allowed to, you know, say anything. You know, it's fine. You know, I can say, you know, I won't get in trouble for saying names of, you know, the charismatics and the TV preachers. But if you start saying names of Baptists, Oh, now you can't do that. No matter how bad their preaching is, you can't say the names of some of these Baptists. Otherwise, people get so bent out of shape. And how dare you speak against the man of God? Well, how just just because somebody's Baptist, it doesn't make them a man of God. If they're not preaching the truth, they're not a man of God. Okay, and it's like they think Baptist automatic man of God. No, if they're preaching lies, they're not a man of God. And so, you know, if I start saying names, you know, don't get bent out of shape. Don't get mad. These people are wolves. They're, they're infiltrating churches and not, not here. All right. You know, if you start naming, tell me some of these people that are out there that you're listening to, you know, I'll tell you, those people are idiots. Those people are wolves. Don't listen to those people. I, I've got no problem doing that. And so we've got a, uh, that, that's part of my job as a pastor. And so uh, I haven't heard y'all talking about any of these, you know, goofballs out there yet, but if I start hearing stuff, don't get mad when I name them. That's my job. If I don't do that, you don't have a pastor. Okay. doesn't matter that I have that title and you go to this church. If I'm not doing my job, like it says in here, he's, he's cursing all these pastors and these shepherds and it, they're there, but he's saying they have no shepherd because they weren't doing their job. And so if I don't, if I don't get on these people, if I don't, if I'm not doing all these things, if I'm not feeding the flock, if I'm not visiting the flock in a good and a bad way, if I'm not protecting from wolves, you don't have a pastor. So just deal with it when it happens. But we see in verse four, it meant, you know, it mentions, uh, you know, it's talking about all the things that you haven't done. You know, it says with force and cruelty, have ye ruled them? Pastors, they should, 
They should teach. They should be a good example. But they're not to be a tic- dictator. She says it with force and cruelty. Have ye ruled them? That's not, that is not our job. We are not, we are not dictators. Like I said, I'm not going to go over to your house. I'm not going to administer punishments. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go and, you know, be a bill collector. You know, if you get behind on your tie, I'm not going to do any of those things. That's, that is not my job. I'm not going to use force. I'm not going to use cruelty. I'm going to, you know, I will gently entreat you. You know, I will say things. Hey, and it's, it's amazing. You know, the Bible has a whole process on what you're supposed to do to remove people from the church. If people, you know, are committing certain sins, but you know what I've learned is that, you know, I, I've never, ever seen it get to where you had to bring somebody before the church and remove, them. I've never seen it get to that point. Usually all it takes is you go confront that person and say, Hey, I mean, you can be this nice, but you're shacking up with this person. That's fornication. That's not supposed to be once named among you. You either need to separate and, you know, get right with the church or uh, you just need to get out. You know what? They usually just get out. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, it, I mean, you can be that gentle, that nice. And they, and they, they usually scatter. Somebody is in the church spreading around false teaching or something. All you have to do is go tell them you shouldn't do that. You need to stop that. And they, they, they start pouting and crying right there and they're gone. Just the littlest thing. It doesn't, it doesn't take much, but at the same time, you know, some places, some preach, they're, they're mean. They're dictators. You know, with, with force and with cruelty, they know how to guilt trip people. And they, and they, you know, they know how to manipulate. And they know how to, you know, turn everybody against them. And it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's bad in some places. I mean, some churches, literally, it's almost like a cult sometimes. And, I mean, the pastor has all this power over the people and I mean, they are so scared to ever cross him in anything. And they, it's to the point where they're not even serving God anymore because they're so scared of the pastor using force and cruelty. That's not, that's not right. Listen, if you and I have a disagreement, we ought to be able to have a disagreement and keep it between us. But you know, it would be wrong for me if I'm talking with Brother Lonnie and you know, he's like, you know, pastor, I didn't completely agree with what you said. You know, and then I get up in church. Well, folks, we got to deal with a wolf. We got, we got Brother Lonnie going against what the man of God says, you know, trying to teach false doctrine, you know, and he dis, he disagrees with me on this. And who knows how many people he's been talking to. I think we need to vote him out. You know, you know how wrong that would be. You know how bad that would make him feel. I mean, he's, he's going to get his feelings hurt so bad. You know, he's, he's going to leave and never come back. I mean, we, you know, we, we could destroy him with that kind of thing. And there are some preachers that are like that. Man, you, you just ask them questions and they spaz out. I mean, they do. You can't even ask a question without them spazzing out. And it's, it's sad. You know, I mean, that, when people can't even ask you a question, you, to me, that is one of the biggest signs of insecurity in the world. I, I'm telling you, and I have proved this in many cases, I'm not afraid to face anybody. And could talk to anybody about my beliefs. I will, I, I'm not afraid of anybody. I don't care how, you know, big they are. You know, I, I, I don't care. I'm confident enough in my position. I will talk to anybody on it. But I know preachers out there, when I've just questioned, hey, what's, you know, why are you teaching this? Doesn't the Bible say, and they just lose it. And I did. I had one lose it on me the other day, just freaked out because I'm just trying to, hey, you know, what's going on here? You know, the Bible says this. And, you know, just, I mean, just, you know, I start bugging out and going crazy and got mad and ran off like a little girl. I'm not lying. Not, not lying. And I'm telling you, how insecure can you be? And these guys too, they get up behind pulpits and they pound their chests and, you know, and they talk about, you know, I, I know what the Bible says, you know, and I'll, I'm not afraid, you know, and they'll, they'll say the things that I'm saying tonight, but they won't back it up. They will not back it up. They'll say that when they know they got a bunch of yes men in front of them that are just going to agree with everything they say. 
but they just can't handle it. And they've got, and many times there's people in churches, you know how many people are sitting in churches today that they make the mistake of reading their Bibles and they've got pastors that don't read their Bibles and they're up there preaching foolishness. And these people in churches, they've got to listen to that. And they, they can't even talk to their preachers about the differences they have. And just, they can't, they can't even go to their pastor and say, pastor, you know, you're preaching this, but the Bible says that they can't do that. They will get thrown out of their churches if they do that kind of thing with force and cruelty. They're ruling over them. That's not how it works. So you know, you shouldn't be, you know, there's a way to confront a pastor. There is a way, there is a way to do that. You know, you don't just go up to a preacher and just rebuke him and start chewing him out. You don't do that. You entreat him as a father. And there is, there is a gentle and there is an appropriate and there is a biblical way to do it. Preachers are not supposed to be put up on this pedestal where we cannot ever question them. Okay. We're supposed to be ready to give an answer. We're supposed to be able to, you know, exhort and convince people about our position and what we believe. And people are allowed to have questions and they need to be answered without pastors going crazy and then calling people in the church wolves and running them off from the church. And I think, I think it's sad when you're in a place where people in a church, they can't even talk to their pastors about stuff. That to me is that's wrong. That's cruel. And then, you know, they're in a situation. They don't get fed by the pastor. They're not being visited by the pastor. You know, they're not being protected. The pastor's bringing in, you know, crazy people to preach in their church. They guys that preach all kinds of off the wall, goofball stuff. They bring all these people in and then the people in the church, they can't even ask the pastor about it. They can't even, they can't even question him on anything without him going all berserk. And then if those people dare leave the church, then, you know, they went out from us because they were not of us, you know I mean? And they'll, you know, they'll tell everybody in the church to shun those people. And then those people, they, they walk away just feeling like the scum of the earth. That is wrong. That is cruel. And God hates that kind of thing. And so if you, if, as a pastor, if I don't do my job, God will get somebody else to do it. Hey, look what it says in Jeremiah 23 in verse 3. It says, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. God's saying, hey, if you're going to do that, if you're going to scatter the sheep, okay, if you're a pastor and you're doing all those things, you can't even answer people's questions, and they leave your church, that is you scattering the sheep. Okay, that's not someone else scattering the sheep. They like to blame other people, blame other preachers, stuff like that. No, that's you. You're the one, you're the one doing that. Even if they're listening to some TV preacher, some internet, internet preacher that maybe gets them off and veers them away. As a pastor, you ought to be able to know the Bible good enough that you can disprove what those people are teaching. If they're teaching a lie, okay? If there's a TV preacher out there that's teaching false doctrine, I ought to know my Bible well enough that if you come to me and say, hey, I'm hearing this from this guy, I ought to be able to prove that person wrong. And it's, it's, and honestly, I haven't seen a TV preacher that I'm scared of. Their doctrine is so weak and so easy to disprove. I mean, and I don't think any of y'all are dumb enough to fall for most of these people. But if you did, I think I could pretty easily show you from the Bible where they're wrong. And I, I can't think of a preacher out there that I'm scared of. But yet you got a lot of preachers that are scared to death of certain preachers. And I just, to me, the only ones you need to be scared of are the ones preaching the truth when you're lying. That's the way I, that's the way I see it. And I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not scared of these people. You know, some of you all, you know, you listen to other preachers online and things like that. And if these guys are preaching the truth, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. If they're lying, then just, you can come talk to me. I'll show you where they're wrong and we'll go from there. I have enough faith in you that I think you all believe the Bible enough that if I show you where, if I can show you where they're wrong, you'll believe it. But it's like, it's amazing how dumb some pastors think their people are. 
And it's like, man, who who do you think these people are that you're pastoring? I mean, you think that you think they're all a bunch of morons, and some of them some of them act like they do. And so, you know, it, but if I don't do my job, God's going to get somebody else to do it. And so, just once again, just because somebody has the title of pastor doesn't mean they are one. If they're not doing their job, they're not a pastor. I can go maybe find some place online where I can get a doctor doctor degree, you know, medic for to be a medical doctor. But you know what? Just because I get a title or have a degree doesn't mean I am one. I sure wouldn't, you wouldn't want me cutting you open. You wouldn't want me, you know, operating on you when you're sick. You wouldn't want me doing that. I'm definitely not qualified. And just because I have the title does not mean I am one. And there's a lot of people that are pastoring churches standing behind pulpits and they have no business being there. They, some of these preachers that are up behind pulpits, they look like I would look on a, at an operating table, cutting somebody open, uh, you know, I'd be passing out you know, <laughs> if, if I, 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 could, I couldn't do that kind of thing. And so, you know, you can say, well, all these things you're saying here, they're from the Old Testament, but look at 1 Peter. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5 and see if we are not seeing the same thing talked about in 1 Peter. I can find it. It's in the New Testament, right? First, there you go. First Peter chapter five, verse one. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Okay, an elder. I'm writing to the elders. He's like, I'm an elder. I'm a leader in the church. Look what he says. Feed the flock of God. Didn't we see that in the Old Testament? Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre of a ready mind. Don't you be getting fat off of this. You know, you don't be doing this just for the money. You do it because it's what God's called you to do. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So y'all see that right there? We're not, we're not just here ruling over people. We're supposed to be feeding the flock. We're supposed to be, you know, visiting the flock, you know, dealing with situations, you know, helping meet the needs of the people. That is the job of a pastor. And if I don't do my job, God's going to get somebody else to do it. And so I want to do my job. But look, go back. Let's go back to 1 Samuel. I want to show you an example of bad pastoring and what it does to the people. And I understand, too, a pastor today isn't exactly the same thing as a priest was in the Old Testament. But there's definitely some similarities and I think some uh, things that we can look at. But First Samuel chapter 2, this is an example of somebody in the Bible that I do not like. I do not like this Bible character, and I especially do not like his sons. And that is man, uh, Eli. Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. I know some Eli's, Hophni's, and Phinehas. All right? I, I know some of these people, and I don't like them. All right? And I, I think this is wrong. Look at First Samuel 2, verse 12. But it says... Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said... To the man that sacrificed, give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now, when you read that, it's like, okay, I, I don't really get what they did that was so bad there. But if you go back to Leviticus chapter 7, verses 22 through 27, it gives the instructions for how they were supposed to do that and how they were supposed to pull the meat out of there and they weren't supposed to eat the fat. They weren't supposed to eat it raw. There was, there was specific instructions on how these procedures were supposed to be done. And they, and they mattered. And we see in the Bible that, you know, th thank God we don't have to do all those offerings and things today. Jesus Christ did all that for us. But those things were, they were very tedious. They were very meticulous. 
God wanted it done a certain way and it was an abomination when it wasn't done right. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they didn't do the sacrifice right. They offered strange fire and the fire came out and consumed them. And now you've got Hophni and Phinehas. They are in this offering where the priests would eat some of the meat. They're getting greedy with it. They're going completely against the rules for it, the way God had told them to do it. And I encourage you to read that passage in Leviticus chapter 7, and it'll give you a better picture. We don't have time to go through it. But basically what they were doing is these guys were just being greedy. They wanted, they wanted the meat. They wanted to eat the fat. They didn't even mind eating it raw. I mean, these guys are just being greedy animals. They're not doing it. I mean, they are, it was a holy thing that they were doing with these sacrifices. And these guys are just being gluttons about it being disgusting about it. And the people, they knew how things were supposed to be done. Those people weren't stupid. They knew what it said in the law of Moses. They had probably seen maybe previous priests who did it, who did it right. And they were watching what these guys are doing. They're like, hey, something's wrong here. Something's not right here. And you know what? There's a lot of people that are in churches today and then you got Eli's, Hophni's, and Phineas's running the churches and people are seeing what's going on in the church and they're like, wait, something's wrong here. They see these churches where they're bringing up these praise teams and these rock bands. And there's people in the church like, wait, something's wrong. Something's wrong going on here. They're going in these churches where people are bringing in other versions of the Bible and they're perverting the word of God. And there's people in the church. They know better. They know that something's wrong. Something's not right with what they're doing here. But they, they can't call, call out the preacher on it. They can't say anything about it. They'll get accused of sowing discord and causing problems in the church. And you know what these people do many times? They finally, they get sick of it. They say enough's enough. They hear these rock bands up on the platform. They hear the foolishness is getting preached from the pulpit. And they're just like, you know what? I'm getting nothing out of this. I'm not being fed. This is not what church is supposed to be. I'm out of here. And they get out of church. And now these people aren't right with God. They're not in church. They're not where they're supposed to be. They're not, they're not giving their tithes and offerings. They're not involved and they're not, they're not, uh, you know, they are forsaking the assembling because they got so disgusted by what was going on in that church and rightfully so. And these people now have sinned. And we see here in the story of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, We'll see a passage here in a little bit where Eli said, you're making the Lord's people to transgress. People abhorred the offering of the Lord. They're like, I'm not going to do this. I, I'm, I know where God commanded us to take these sacrifices and do these things, but these priests aren't doing it right. I don't have to do that. But the truth is, you know, it wasn't their fault that the priests were doing the wrong thing. They still should have kept doing the right thing. People still should keep going to church. They st should still keep doing what God said to do. But you know what? I can see why it's hard for some of these people. You know, I'm sad by what some people have to listen to in Baptist churches. Some of the, just the goofy uh, doctrines that have made it into Baptist churches and people they know better and they have to sit there and they have to listen to that being preached. They got to see all the foolishness that goes on in the church. They see the church wasting money on all the stupid things that churches are wasting money on these days, and they know better. They're not stupid people. They've read their Bibles before. They know what the Bible says, and they watch this stuff going on over and over again, and they get disgusted by it. And eventually, many times, they get out of church. But listen, people, they're not stupid. They're going to figure out your motivations. It says in 1 Samuel 2, verse 29, it says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. These guys were getting fat off the offerings. They be what because they were greedy. They're taking they're taking it all for themselves. Some of these things were supposed to be taken, it was supposed to be burnt, it was a sacrifice, but these guys are eating it all up. And we know the Bible specifically says that Eli was a very fat man. We see it at that story after he found out his sons died, the Ark of the Covenant was gone. He fell backwards and he broke his neck because he, he was very heavy. And I think Hophni and Phinehas were too. I mean, these guys, they were just, I mean, they're just leeching off the people, just greedy. They were committing adultery with the women. They're, I mean, they're making women do wicked things with them because they're just, they're perverts. And I'm telling you, 
even that kind of thing has gone on in churches before, where there's been people, you know, preachers who have taken advantage of women in the church. And there, there's preachers out there that have gotten busted for some of these things. They went on, they passed another church somewhere. Like what in the world? And it's, it's crazy. And the thing is, you know how many people they end up getting out of church because of that? They know that that doesn't have any place in the church, but either way, they are causing people to transgress, to be, go against God. People are eventually going to say enough, enough's enough. We say in verse 17 of chapter two, it says, wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. You know, there's a lot of people today that hate church. You know why? Because what's going on in their church is not church. You know, if I had to sit and listen to a rock concert, I'd hate church. You know, if I had to get up and listen to a preacher get up and pervert the word of God and then just preach about nothing, I would hate church too. But at the same time, I'm not supposed to hate church. I'm supposed to go to church. And yet, many of these pastors, they're not doing their job and people are getting out of church because they're just fed up. Maybe fed up's not a good word because they're not getting fed. (laughs) They're getting starved out. And... As a result, they are now in sin. It says in verse 24, it says, Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. Eli is blaming his boys for this. You're making people hate the offering of the Lord. And they are sinning against God. And so, once again, you know, we can't use other people. You're going to be tempted to do that. When things get difficult in church a lot of times people do you know the pastor's wrong here pastor's wrong there but you know what you need to do if you're uh you know if if i ever go bad if things start going bad here if you're ever in a church that starts going bad you just need to understand is your job to keep doing the right thing you got to do what you're supposed to do and i believe if there's people in the church that are doing what they're supposed to do god's going to see what they're dealing with and god can get rid of that pastor and get a new one if you're in a church that's just garbage and not doing the right thing, you know, and, and I do, I, I feel terrible. You know, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll talk to people that live in places where there's just no good churches and it breaks my heart for these people that I don't, there's, I can't, there's no place that you can send them, but you know what? If you're in a bad church and you keep doing the right thing, I think if you're, if you're in an area where there aren't any good churches, you go to the best one you could possibly find. And if you do the right thing, I think the Lord will either straighten that church out or a new one will start in that area. You know, the Lord Lord knows you're there. He'll take care of you. He'll get you a new shepherd. I believe God will do that. You just got to stay faithful. But people today in many churches, they're basically being encouraged to backslide. You know, the they, Bible says they made the Lord's people to transgress. Do you realize in many churches, you know, if... If you were to move and go to a lot of some churches, they would encourage you to backslide. You know, there's churches, they, they don't want people in there that have high standards and convictions. You know, they don't want people, you know, that are real strong on certain doctrines and, you know, because they want to be able to do their own thing and not feel like anybody's judging them. And you do, they almost, it's like they want you to backslide. But you know what? We can't do that. People, they're being spiritually starved out of many of these churches. Look at what it says in chapter 3. Verse 1, I think this is interesting, but it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Okay, We all know that verse in the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. And people usually use that vision like, Oh, we need to look ahead. We need to have dreams for this church. But when it talks about vision in the Bible, it's basically talking about you know a revealing of God's word. And when it said the word of the Lord was precious in those days, he's saying it was rare... Nobody was preaching the truth. Nobody was doing that. The word of God was a rare thing to come by. Kind of like in a lot of churches. It's pretty rare to find a church that's preaching the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It's hard to find that. The word of the Lord is precious. There is no open vision. In many towns, there is no open vision. I'm sad for all the small towns you know, that are around here and that you know, are pretty far away from any of the bigger towns and there's just no good churches there is no open vision in those towns the word of the lord is precious there you can go visit those churches and just see how much scripture you hear and i mean you're not going to hear much and you might not hear any 
in some of these places. And people are being spiritually starved out. But many pastors, they have failed to do what they were called to do. And I believe God's done with many of them. Look what it says in verse 2. Okay, after we just, the verse we just read there, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, and the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. I don't know if you all realize the significance of what happened there. That lamp of God, if you go back, I forgot uh, where it was, but when God gave the instructions on that lamp, it was supposed to be lit all the time. It was always supposed to be burning. It was always supposed to be going. And Eli let the light go out. And when the light went out, all of a sudden God did something. He, he went to Samuel. God called Samuel and then God ended up raising up Samuel. And even though it wasn't until years later, Eli's doom was, you know, his, his fate was sealed on that day. God was done with Eli. He, he never used him again. Eventually he killed him. He killed his sons. He finally failed. Enough's enough. He let that light go out. He didn't do his job. And God said, I'm done. I'm going to Samuel. And God ended up raising up Samuel. Samuel became, uh, I guess you'd say, the last judge that Israel had before God started, uh, before the kings came along. But I do, I believe many pastors today, they, they have, they've just, they failed. They, they quit preaching the truth. They got too caught up in the filthy lucre. They got too caught up and just wanting to impress other people, wanting to be a big shot and starve the people out. Didn't want to preach things because it wasn't popular. And they let the light go out. And God's done. But you know what? God's done with them, but God's going to raise up other people. God's going to raise up Samuels. God's going to raise up churches that are going to preach the truth, that are going to do the right thing. And you know, you as members of Liberty Baptist Church, you are not under no obligation to sit and listen to false doctrine. You're not. You're not you're, you're not in any obligation to put up with the things we talked about in this message. And if the day ever comes where I'm too pathetic, where I'm just too lazy to do my job, if I'm bleeding the church of all its resources, just so I can elevate myself, so I can fatten myself off, you know, fatten myself off of all of you. You know what? And remember I said this. If I do that, you're free to throw me out. Throw me out. Or if I've got too much power, you know, I dumb enough of you down where I've got the majority and I'm not going to get voted out, then you know what? Go to another church where the truth is being preached. You have my permission right now. I'll change my mind then when I'm pathetic and lazy. Uh, but you know, but right now, uh, you have my permission. You know, don't allow your loyalty to me to cause you to sin against God. Don't ever let don't ever let that happen. And said, I, I, I'm burdened by what's going on in churches today. I, I think it's sad, and I don't ever want that to happen here. I don't want it to happen to you. And so, right now, while I'm right with God. I want to preach this message to you and I hope you never need it. (laughs) I I hope you, I hope you never need it, but you got it, store it away, hang on to it. And if the day ever comes, you need it, you know, remind me of it. And I will have a very creative excuse for why this message, uh, that was, I got caught up in it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll know how to talk my way out of that stuff. All the preachers do. All right. All the preachers do, but you don't have to listen to that. Okay? You don't have to listen to that. Don't fall for it. Make sure your loyalty is to God and will be unto the pastors that scatter the sheep. These, the, the, when the sheep get scattered, it's not because of anybody out there. It's because pastors aren't being shepherds. They're not, they're not doing their job. And so you all pray for me. Pray that I always do, always do my job, always do the right thing. So with that, let's all stand together.